Now, throughout the 1920s, the British were mostly concerned with their own economic difficulties and with imperial policy. The First World War had increased the British national debt 12-fold, up to 172% of British GDP. And by the late 1920s, the interest payments alone on our First World War debt amounted to some 40% of government spending. So roughly equivalent to what the British spend on the NHS right now. So it's a huge percentage of the British government's expenditure. Just on the interest payments alone, that's not going to pay off their debt. Worse, uh, steel, shipbuilding, coal and textiles, the, industry that dominate, the industries that dominated the British economy, were all in possibly terminal decline and the armed forces were made to accept what was known as the 10-year rule. They were made to accept the idea that they would not be required to fight any major war for 10 years and to plan their expenditures accordingly. Uh, this meant that uh, spending on the British armed forces could be slashed from 30% of government spending in 1913, when of course the nation was at peace, down to 10% of government spending in 1933. Uh, the 10-year rule would not be dropped until 1932, when the armed forces would be told to prepare, perhaps, for a war by 1942. But defence spending itself wouldn't actually increase until 1937, and so the British armed forces were, were really preparing for a Second World War beginning by 1947. Uh, it would only pass 4% of GDP in 1938, and so with Britain's global empire, the British are, are roughly spending what the British are spending now, actually, in terms of their GDP on defence. Uh, in 1923, the French and the Belgians occupy the Ruhr, the German industrial heartland that borders France and Belgium. The Germans had started to pay off their reparations bill in 1922, a bill designed for them to pay for all the cost of the damage done to France and Belgium. Remember, the war had in the West largely been fought in France and Belgium, and they had been devastated, and the Germans had deliberately gone out of their way when retreated in 1918, do as much damage as they could to the economies of France and Belgium. And now someone had to pay, and as far as the French and Belgians were concerned, the Germans had done it, and so therefore they could pay for it. And they didn't want to be paid in terms of money, they want to be paid in steel, in timber, in coal, so that they could actually use that stuff to repair the damage and the devastation that had been done to their countries. In 1922, the first shipments had been made. In 1923, Germany refused to hand over the timber that it was owed. It said that it had to sell the timber on the open market, and it couldn't just give it to France and Belgium. The Germans were trying out the French and, Be the French and Belgian resolve, seeing if they could wheedle out of their the responsibilities under the Treaty of Versailles. France and Belgium are, however, determined to take what they are owed and occupy the Ruhr to get it. But the British oppose this action. They say that it's questionably legal and it's going to raise international tension. The German Chancellor of the time, a man called Kuno, had deliberately made Germany default as a test of will for the British and French. Poincare, uh, the French Prime Minister, argued that once... Germany had broken free of Versailles, it could then rearm and plunge the world again into a new war. The Germans respond to the occupation of the Ruhr with passive resistance. They tell people to stay at home, don't go to work, and to pay, and they, so they'll pay them to stay at home. And to do this, they print money, vast quantities of it, leading to higher inflation and then galloping hyperinflation. Uh, as you'll find in many school textbooks, the cost of a single egg goes from 30 fennigs, you know, 30, you know, less than a mark, up to 80 billion marks within the space of just a few months. People have to carry money in wheelbarrows, and famously when some people were given their day's pay in a wheelbarrow, when somebody left their wheelbarrow outside the house, when they locked the door, someone stole the wheelbarrow, but left the money by tipping the wheelbarrow out because the money was worthless. You'll get, you can easily find pictures of children making kites out of money, people using money as wallpaper, people burning money to cook their food because it's cheaper than turning the oven on. The money becomes worthless because they print it. 
eventually under this economic strain and faced with the fact that the French and Belgians aren't going anywhere until they've got what they're owed, Weimar Germany is forced to back down and agree to pay what they owe, triggering the first effort of the Nazi party to try and take control and overthrow the democratic German state in what's known as the Beer Hall Putsch in Munich, which fails, and Hitler is put in Landsberg prison, but in a very comfortable cell if you, if you look at the pictures. However, internationally, France was seen as an aggressor, attempting imperialism in the heart of Europe. The British and the Americans then wage economic war on the French, forcing it to agree to a reduction in the reparations payments the Germans owe to the French and Belgians in what's known as the Dawes Plan of 1924. In 1925, the Locarno Treaties are signed. France and Germany agree that Germany's new western borders are fair and that Britain and Italy would help whichever nation got attacked. But this was crucial because Germany firstly said nothing about its eastern borders. Poland is outraged because Germany is loudly saying, oh yes, we agree that our borders with France and Belgium are fair. And Poland's going, well, what about the borders with Poland? Germany goes, we said the borders with France and Belgium are fair. And Poland's like, ooh, ooh, that's not good. But the British and French aren't, in, aren't interested in Eastern Europe and allow Germany to say nothing about their new Eastern borders to the fury of the East European states. Also, Germany is delighted because they're being treated as an equal with the French. The British and Italians are very clear in saying that if Germany attacks France, they'll declare war on Germany. But also, if France attacks Germany, they'll declare war on France. And so the alliance, the old alliance of the First World War, has been torn apart. In 1929, German reparations bills are reduced still further in the Young Plan, which cuts German, the German bills by 20%. And the Americans in this time period are lending huge amounts of money to Germany to rebuild the German economy. The theory is that they can rebuild the German economy and Germany can use the profits from these new roads and these new factories to pay off the reparations bill and then pay off the, uh, pay off the debts. During the 1920s, the Germans are given, or rather lent, far more money by the Americans than actually their total reparations bill. So when they say they couldn't have paid, they most certainly could have paid. They just choose not to. Uh, they do have the, the money available. But it means that when it comes to it, Germany has been given or lent more money by the Americans than the Germans are giving to the French and Belgians by a huge margin. But in 1929, the world economy crashes in, thanks to the Wall Street crash, which leads to the Great Depression. It's... Uh, leads to a global recession. Global trade from 1929 falls by 50%. It is the longest and deepest economic depression of the 20th century. And Germany has been dependent for its economic recovery on American loans. It had borrowed twice the value of reparations from America from 1925 to 28 and now the Americans are asking for their money back. And of course the Germans have spent it. They don't have it. And so suddenly the German economy grinds to a halt. Also the German economy is, even now, Germany is an export-geared economy. They sell stuff to the world, but the world has become suddenly impoverished with the collapse of trade and people aren't buying German goods. And so unemployment rises and rises in Germany. By 1933, unemployment in Germany would reach 6 million people. The governments in Germany of Brunin, followed by von Papen, and then General Schleicher, would all fail to deal with the crisis, eventually bringing Hitler to power in 1933 on the back of the desperation of the German people for somewhere to live, something to eat, and a job to do to pay for it all. Meanwhile, Japan is devastated too as Japan is also an export-geared economy, and it saw that China was weak, just beginning to emerge from its bloody civil war. And they can see that the British and the French and the Belgians and the Portuguese all have an empire to lean on, and they want one too, and they'll take it in China.